Institute for Progressive Values. And I'm really happy to be here to moderate this conversation uh, with the author of the Wahhabi Code, Terence um, Ward. So in the spirit of the Kassin Bustani Friendship Forum, we wanted to actually start and frame this conversation that we're having tonight in a loving way. And that is, we come from the spirit of love for uh, the Middle East, particularly from Terence's perspective. Um, as someone who's lived in uh, that region for many, many decades. And for me, as uh, an American Muslim, and I speak um, critically, self-critically of uh, my faith traditions from, from loving Islam. And so please take our criticism as constructive criticism and coming from the spirit of making things better not just for the Muslim world, but for the world, the, the, the global um, climate uh, at large. So I suppose let's start with the basics, and we're going to start with Terence explain, explaining to us uh, a little bit about the history of Wahhabism. How did it start, and how did it become? Thank you, Lani, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here. Um, for both the World Affairs Council and also the Marcanas, for, shall I say, having also the courage to uh, have this discussion. Um, let me also say that every person that you meet in uh, politics, in the diplomatic corps, in uh, this, this horrendous new industry called security services, uh, people in the military, ambassadors, uh, will all tell you what I'm about to tell you tonight. They'll tell you and they'll speak about it in private. What makes this evening a little bit unique is that this is a conversation we're having in the public, which is to say there's been a long silence. And the question then becomes, obviously, why the silence? And I'm sure many of you all, uh, many of you have your own um, assumptions of why that silence has remained fixed. But as uh, Ani was saying before I try, try to unwrap this question of Wahhabism, which is not a very uh, simple uh, uh, issue to unwrap, I wanted to also reiterate what Ani was saying, her journey. Uh, to found this group called Progressive Muslims for Human Rights. Uh, her journey to actually take on herself to uh, go into scripture, to, the, to, to cite the place where Muhammad, uh, the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, actually conferred upon one of his women followers to lead the prayers one day. Using that precedent, Ani and other uh, uh, colleagues have taken that to heart. And so there are communities of uh, Muslims in America that have women imams. Now, you haven't seen it. It hasn't been on television. Everybody's been saying, where are the Muslims who are speaking out? And what I hope that you leave tonight with this the simple realization there are reasons why these kind of messages have not been heard. Money buys censorship. Money buys editors. Editors are fearful of how they will be perceived. Uh, money has purchased politicians. Money and oil has purchased uh, governments, heads of governments, and as you'll discover, also have also allowed a, um, a, a tradition, a cultural tradition from Central Arabia to, uh, to expand across traditional uh, Islamic world, mainstream Islamic world, tolerant Islamic world, and uh, with the intent to impose a radically different form of belief. So I come to this whole question 
not as not from any security angle or any of those uh, all of those characters that one sees on television uh, from time to time, ex uh, military people. I come simply as someone bearing voice to speak truth to power echoing the voices that I've heard from many Muslim friends who have lamented ever since 2001 that, that, their, uh, that their faith has been hijacked, that, uh, that they, are, uh, they, find, they find in their own countries that their traditional mainstream tolerant Islam is now under siege because of what is called Dawa Wahhabiya, in Arabic, Dawa means mission. Wahhabiya means of the Wahhabi tradition. And this siege is something, again, that many uh, 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 in the West have no idea is happening. The assumption is, well, if there are those who have occupied Mecca, because I use the word occupied, Mecca was the center of the Sufi universe for a thousand years before uh, the Wahhabi uh, uh, Bedouins from Central Arabia conquered it. Hey, Terry, um, yes. we must also clarify what Sufi is, is ah. as well. So if you can okay. touch on that a little okay. bit and then go on to the, the Wahhabi mm -hmm. ideology. Sure. That would be great. Okay, <laughs> so uh, a faith is born. And it's born in the deserts, well, actually, in, in Mecca, with the revelation uh, uh, to the prophet. And that faith came in a context, in a tradition. But when the Islamic faith spread across the world, it enriched itself with all the diversity of populations and traditions that it encountered which is to say, it also changed. You've all heard the words Sufi or Sunni and Shia, no? The Shia tradition is a bit different than the Sunni tradition because the question of who are the heirs becomes important for the Shia. And why not, if the mantle of the Prophet was going to be handed, well, shouldn't it be handed to his offspring? Shia would argue, yes, it should have gone down the line of Fatima, his daughter, the son-in-law, Ali, who married, and then Hussein and Hassan were the, the grandsons, and then the, the, uh, the line of the prophet. Well, they are considered saints in the Shia tradition. And worshipped as such, very much like in the Catholic Church. Well, in the, uh, in the Wahhabi tradition, this is heresy. It's not even to be discussed, it's heresy. These are apostates. The mere fact that they, they pray with perhaps a piece of clay from Kabbalah, which is where Hussein was martyred, and pray in that way, uh, they're condemned by Abdul Wahhab as heretics. Now, just unpackage what that means. The Sufis instead take a whole different approach. As the religion spread, their teachers <coughs> who emerge, each teacher creates a tariqa, which is a school. A school of what? Of teachings. But the journey went in a very poetic way into this question of looking at God as the source of love, as this divine beloved. This metaphor keeps circling again and again through Sufi poetry. And the modes of worship are very different than what you would typically see in a, in a traditional uh, Sufi uh, worship. Which is to say, there is chanting, there can be music, there can be clapping, there can be just very quiet sort of working with rosary beads, or there can actually be dancing. Like those of you who have seen the Medlevis of, of Konya, Darwish, who dance. Now that journey, the whirling, isn't to uh, present joy to the audience. On the contrary, it's to, to help that believer transport, elevate, to eliminate the duality between himself 
and the divine, to become one. The word fanna in, in, uh, in Arabic in Persian is the melting away of the ego to become one. So already what we're exploring now across the Islamic world are all of these tiny kinds, these Sufi uh, 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 groups. Now, all of this and the Sunni large mainstream were intact for 1400 years. I repeat, 1400 years before, sorry, let's, let's say 1200 years, before in the center of Arabia, 250 years ago, a man named Abdul Wahab, uh, a teacher, proclaimed his, uh, his interpretation of the faith. And what he proclaimed was that he, and only his interpretation of the faith, was the true Islam. That all of these centuries of traditions, of changes within Islam, that had created this very diverse uh, faith, a global faith, a faith that was very cosmopolitan, traveled from, from, the, from the shores of, uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, the Atlantic in Morocco, all the way to the far reaches of Indonesia, and, the, and lapping on the green Pacific shores of, uh, of what's called the Malay Archipelago. All of those lands had different interpretations, and there never was an accepted, accepted, conflict that was defined between one Muslim and another. This was considered haram, forbidden. Well, Abdul Wahab changed the rules in 19, uh, sorry, 1744. He made a pact with a uh, tribal leader from the Saud family. And the pact was, I will give you my allegiance and my followers will give you my, our allegiance in return for securing my version of the faith. So in 1744, a pact is made between the religious teacher, Abdul Wahab, Muhammad Abdul Wahab, and the first leader of what now has become the Saud dynasty. From that moment, from that moment, because also within Abdul Wahab's teachings were not only, the, uh, very few Saudis like to hear the word Wahhabi, but I'm using it because everyone else in the world uses it, certainly in the Arab world. But the idea of Tawheed is unity with God, pure unity. If you take it to the extreme, which some Muslims would argue uh, Abdul Wahab did. That unity is, is predefined and cannot be negotiated. Which is to say, if uh, these three people over here happen to have a leader or a teacher that may be of the Mevlevi tradition, Sufi, or that gentleman over there may be Shia, or this one over here may be from the Sufi tradition of the Naqshbandi. Or there may just be a, a, a Sunni sitting over there who does not follow the Wahhabi uh, pronouncement on no smoking, uh, no dancing, no music, uh, very rigid, very austere uh, form of Islam in the Sharia that Abdul Wahhab pronounces. All of us, all of you could be condemned. And Within the condemnation, the word kafir is used. Kafir means non-believer. Non-believer to for Ani and us, for Ani and us to condemn you, we would simply takfir you. You would be you would be excommunicated. You would now be apostates. And within Abdul Wahab's logic, you then would suffer the consequences because as followers of his pure line of thinking, we also have been given the con, we have been condoned to take your lives and to seize your property. All of you who were shocked when you saw what the ISIS fighters were doing with the Yazidi women who were seized as property, as sex slaves after their men had been slaughtered, 
you didn't understand the dramatic intent. Under Wahhabi teachings, they were legal property to be held. When the, uh, when the various uh, temples, whether they be at Palmyra, or shall we even say the Buddhas of Bamiyan that had existed under Muslim rule for 1,200 years had never been touched, but under a Wahhabi-inspired Taliban government, they saw fit to destroy them. The point is, destroy all history. History is not important. All of that civilization is irrelevant. We have the true answer. So, in that construct, what I've described to you is not a tolerant uh, form of, of Islam. It's a very young, very brash, a very uh, unrelenting and intolerant interpretation of Islam. If it stayed in Saudi Arabia, if it stayed in the center of Arabia, which is where it was born, the world would not have a problem. The problem is Dawah Wahhabiyah, the mission that exports it all across the Islamic world and into Europe as well. So let me um, push the envelope a little bit here too. I would say that um, I would take issue with the word Puritan because it's not Puritan, it's actually a bastardization of Islam. It's a twisted interpretation of Islam. Distortion. Many, distortion. many Muslims will say it's a, it's a distortion. Yeah. And so mm. when a lot of these, um, this particular interpretation of Islam is, has been promoted by way of the petrodollars and mm. how it's basically infused and um, exported to wherever there are Muslims, it has become, uh, it has co-opted the true en essence of the spirit of Islam that is one is that is inclusive. And so here we have now um, a conflict within the Muslim world on ideologies is that one of inclusivity, which is founded in Islam its inception, mm -hmm. and one that is intolerant and e exclusive. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the fight that is happening, not just on religious terms, but also in political terms. And so um, I would say that um, the background that you've given is a very comprehensive from the essence of Sufism and, and Sunni and Shia and Wahhabism as the, this new version of Islam, supposed Islam. How do you think then is, um, are, are your regular, uh, the, the, the religious implication on just individuals living wherever they live, whether it be in the West or even in the Muslim world, to speak up against this? Mm. Um, the, the, the fear factor yeah. that we have to deal with. The, the fear factor is very real. Everybody uh, that I have met that talking about this, this question, uh, personally with various people over the years, I'm always encountering um, uh, Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Americans or Europeans who say, well, where are the Muslims? Where are the moderate Muslims speaking up? And I'm so happy that all of you can hear Ani today because she has the courage of a lion. Uh, she has received threats, of course, as, uh, as anyone would in this environment. Fear is a, what has kept so many people silent. But let me shape why they're silent. Because here in America we have the sense that one can say no matter what, I mean, good God, we have a president who says no matter what every day. But quite honestly, uh, uh, Ahmed Karim, a friend, Egyptian, he lives in New York. And he says to me, Terry, I can't say this to anyone. He says, if I do, if I speak out publicly, I know that within 24 hours, the Mohabarat, which means the secret police, of General Sisi will be kicking down the door of my parents' house. They will be taken in for questioning, probably tortured, and I will have gained nothing. I live in a country where a president doesn't have the courage to speak out and tell the truth. How can you expect me to put everything on the line for that? And you'll hear that in the UK from any Muslim. You'll hear it in Germany. You'll hear it in France, which is to say no one has cover. And if, if, again, it's hard for us 
to feel that kind of uh, that kind of reach. But in the Arab world, it's very direct. Secret services are very immediate, and they're very unforgiving, and they act very quickly. The political powers that be, that little tour that. Uh, uh, Crown Prince Bil Salman made to Tunisia where he was met with a, uh, a few uh, protesters and then he went on uh, to, I believe, Jordan. I mean, that tour was all about giving money to the politicians and in return for their silence, in return for any criticism. You'll note that he only went to Argentina and, and did not uh, plan a tour through Europe. And money has bought that silence for, for decades. But if you talk, if any of you leave this room and you ask any Muslim that you know or have ever met or will meet in the future, tell me, what do you feel about uh, the Saudi role? What do you feel about what Wahhabism is doing to Islam? If you can project some sense of sincerity and care, you will hear a confession. And it's a heartbreaking confession because there is this sense that, that, that one cannot speak 